What is it, my friend? Welcome to episode number 112 of the Anthony Chainmix podcast. In this episode, I'm bringing you the CEO and founder of CrowdSpring to talk about how to save you from bad graphic design. Plus, we get into his personal breakthroughs, lessons from his lives of just scaling in a really awesome, awesome business. So if you want to save yourself from having bad design with logos, social media graphics, or any branding and design needs, and learn some massive awesome keys to successfully scaling a business, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Anthony John Amix Podcast, the one and only podcast designed to help you become unstoppable in life and business. My name is Anthony John Amix. My friends call me AJ. And my goal with this podcast is to help you remember who you truly are so you can maintain your center in the chaos, embody your potential, and unlock freedom in your life and business. That being said, let's get into today's show. All right, welcome back. Now, before I tell you about today's guest, I wanna let you know about my book called Mindset Is Not Enough. You know, so many entrepreneurs are always looking for the edge, right? Like an edge in their marketing, an edge in their sales, an edge for just like really embodying their potential and bringing their big visions to life. And a lot of people will tell you, well, like get your mindset on point. Like if you get your mindset on point, then you'll be successful. Now, if that was true, wouldn't every single person who's ever read a personal development book pretty much be successful by me now? I mean, I'm sure you know of at least three people who've read a book that has shaped their mindset and their outlook on life, and yet they still don't have the results that they want in their life. So there just has to be more to the game than mindset. Well, after guiding hundreds of people to creating results in their own lives, I found there is something I call your body set that will always, 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 always overpower any mindset work that you do. And I dive deep into this concept in my book called Mindset Is Not Enough, and you can get the entire book for free by going to ajamix.com slash book. You know, I had one guy tell me just the other day that the book was so profound and shaping his life that he listened to the book on repeat pretty much every day for a year. So go to ajamix.com slash book to get the entire book for free. With that being said, let's talk about today's guest. His name is Ross Kimbarovsky. He's the founder and CEO of CrowdSpring, which is the design company that can help you with everything from logo to web design to custom business names and everything in between. They have over like 220,000 vetted creatives who will have your back. And Ross immigrated to the U.S. from the Ukraine in 1979, and after a 13-year career as a successful trial attorney, he chose to like swing into um, creating CrowdSpring in 2007, and he leads that business to this day. He has been honored as one of Tech Week's 100 top technology leaders and business visionaries. He's founded numerous other startups, including Startup Foundry, Quickly Legal, and Respect, and he wears shorts and sandals to work pretty much every single day. So with that being said, let's bring him onto the show. Well, Ross, welcome to the podcast, brother. How you doing? Good, Anthony. Happy to be here talking with you and your listeners. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Well, tell me a little bit more like about CrowdSpring. Uh, it sounds like you're helping startups. How did you even get from there? Because you went from like trial attorney, attorney stuff into the game of business, which is a bit uh, strange. Let's just be honest, a little bit strange journey. Well, it. Yes and no. I mean, ultimately, let me, let me first tell you what CrowdSpring is. CrowdSpring helps entrepreneurs, small businesses, agencies, and nonprofits with everything from logo design to web design, marketing materials, and even naming businesses. Uh, we have a community of 220,000 designers, clients in 100 countries. And, and we started the business believing that great design doesn't have to cost tens of thousands of dollars. Projects start at $299 for custom uh, work. Awesome. And, and so, while my my start was maybe a little bit unusual, it's it's what drives most entrepreneurs to start a business. So I started practicing law in '95, uh, and was a trial attorney for 13 years, and I'd always been entrepreneurial when I started working. I started different uh, practices within my law firm. In 2006, I um, was looking to redesign my firm's website and went through this process that business owners go through. We put together our requirements. We talked to agencies, we asked them to bid on the work, we interviewed them, picked one, paid them a lot of money, uh, waited a couple of months, got the work, and I hated all of it. And I was very frustrated because it was expensive, it was awful, and I was embarrassed that, that we were kind of stuck with a design that I didn't love. And so I went back in frustration thinking, there's got to be a better way for me to solve this problem for myself. And, and for other people to solve the same exact problem. And, and that ultimately led to this idea for CrowdSpring um, and a business model that turns it upside down rather than uh, 
getting bids and proposals and picking one you like and then waiting, kind of like we did in the beginning, CrowdSpring works differently. If you want a custom logo, you set your price. And instead of bids and proposals, people create actual custom logos for your business and you pick the one you love. Um, and so it frees entrepreneurs and business owners from having to worry that they speak the same language. It frees them from having to look at profiles and portfolios. And of course, it frees them from the tens of thousands of dollars it used to cost to create these kinds of brand identities. And at the same time, it gave power to this global community of creatives, freelancers around the world. So, so for me, like for many entrepreneurs, it was solving my own problem that showed me there's a better way. And while I was very happy as an attorney, uh, the opportunity to start my own business and help a global group of people was, was really very tempting. Dude, I love it. I love how you've taken a challenge and turned it into an opportunity. Why do you think like most people don't get the designs they want? Is it just because they have these expectations and the expectations aren't honored? Or is it because they have this vision that they haven't clearly articulated and just the designers aren't able to really bring it to life because it just wasn't communicated clearly? Well, those are two very important reasons. Uh, People have a tough time if they're not a designer, if they don't have a design background, communicating what they want. I, I know I did as a, as a business owner. And so that's a big reason. Um, expectations obviously are different. One of the big reasons is, is we don't buy design and creative services like we buy anything else. You know, you're wearing a hoodie. You picked it out when you looked at a couple different ones and you pick the one you like, you pick the color that you like. That's how we buy things. Uh, if you're shopping for a television set, we do the same thing. But when we buy design services historically, this is for hundreds and thousands of years, you're generally looking at somebody's portfolio. You're saying, all right, I'll pay you this much. And then you wait and they give you one or two designs. And the problem is that people like choice. And so in a typical CrowdSpring project, you're going to pick from 50 to 100 custom logos. That's very different than when you hire a single designer and you get one or two designs. And so when you're picking hoodies or microphones or televisions and you get to pick the one you like, it's really easy for us, whether we're a designer or not. We aesthetically know we like this one better. We can ask our uh, customers, our prospects, our family, our friends. But when you work in a traditional model, when you just get no choice, that's frustrating. So lots of reasons why historically design has failed. And these are the things we sought to redefine and, mm -hmm. and, and revolutionize with CrowdSpring. Do you think a lot of business owners look for agencies to save them? And, and that's why even the designer um, could show up to the best of the ability and they're still not going to be happy because the, the client, right? The business owner is looking to be saved from the agency. Do you understand what I mean by that? I do. And, and, and there's definitely something to that. And, and agencies are in part at fault for that because agencies have historically um, told clients, told business owners, you know, great design is important and it'll save your business. And, and look, the reality is good design is good business. It's very important. Here's where we differ from agencies. Good design isn't going to save a bad product. Good design is not gonna rescue a terrible service. If you don't know how to communicate, good design doesn't make you a better communicator. So business fundamentals are always important. You have to have a great product. You have to have a great service. You have to make connections with customers. When you do those things, if you have bad design, it undercuts your ability to grow your business. It undercuts your credibility as an individual and the credibility of your business or service. And so. When all of the other things are in good shape, good design elevates your brand, it helps you become more credible, and it helps you become more powerful. But, but ultimately, the reality is solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, small businesses can't pay tens of thousands of dollars for, for design. They're not in a position to do that. Big companies, yes, mid-sized companies, maybe, but small businesses can't afford to do that. And so one of the reasons we started CrowdSpring 12 years ago was to solve that problem. How do you give business owners who have limited budgets but are still looking for good quality design the opportunity to find good quality design at 10 to 50 times less than they were historically paying? Do you think like most business owners just have like a feeling of what they want and they're, they're attempting to now convey that feeling to the designer and then the designer is now taking that, that feeling, that vision, and then they're bringing it to reality. Is that what's really kind of happening? For most, I, I think it, the, the process really depends. Uh, it depends on the 
uh, familiarity of a business owner with design and with design language, because most people don't don't speak the design language and have a tough time articulating. And of course, it depends on the designer understanding what the client wants. So, so one thing that we do, and, and we saw a problem there myself when I was looking to hire an agency to redo the, the website I, I talked about earlier, I didn't speak the design language. I mm -hmm. had a hard time articulating these things. So we've spent the last 12 years trying to figure out a way to solve this problem. So we have 33 categories of projects, everything from logos to websites, industrial, product design, and each one has dynamic question and answers where we ask very specific to the project category you're looking for, specific questions that help educate our design community about your needs. And so we assume that most clients are going to have a tough time communicating what they need. And so we help them along the way. And clients that have a great communicative style and can speak with designers can, can do that directly as well. Uh, but that is a very common problem, not just with design, as you know, but, but lots of things. I mean, if, you, if you're a business coach and you're coaching business clients, sometimes they have a tough time articulating exactly the problem they're facing. And good coaches can unearth that by asking the right questions. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with you that great coach, coaches can, you know, ask great questions to figure it out. And I think there's this unspoken element of communication that people can pick up on if they allow themselves to start listening to a client or listening to a person or listening to a company between the words that they're saying. I think every human has this ability where they're like, what I hear you saying is A, B, and C, but what I feel from you is X, Y, and Z. Is that what you really mean? And giving ourselves permission to start listening between the words. Do you feel like that would help more designers and business owners communicate more efficiently? Absolutely. And this is, you know, so I'm a former trial attorney. And so, so listening for me is a core skill. It's a lifelong skill. Um, I have three kids, so it, 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 it's something that I try to instill in them. And, and this is the crux of, I think, why a lot of leaders, a lot of managers really fail at leadership and management. Generally and culturally in the U.S. and in most countries in the world, we listen to respond. So we listen just so that we can get our point in. And most of us are sitting at the edge of our seat saying, I wish he'd stop or she would stop talking so I could tell him really what, what, what I want to say. We don't listen to understand. And as you said, really important listen to understand because those are different skill sets. Yes. Listening to understand means that you really appreciate what somebody is communicating, even if they haven't communicating it to you in the most clear way possible. And, and you suggested one technique to do it, which is try to restate it and say, here's what I'm hearing you say, which is very different than waiting until somebody says something and then momentarily just starting to give them arguments and answers and all of that. That's, that's listen and respond. And, and that makes managers uh, weaker manager. It makes leaders weaker leaders. And it, it creates business owners who have a really tough time communicating with their team. Yeah. And I, I think outside of even just the game of business, it makes us weaker humans, <laughs> like limits our ability just to connect on a human level, especially when it's needed more than ever in the current climate of the world. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is true in politics and families with kids, with friends, you know, there, there are friends with whom you can have deep conversations on about just about any topic. Uh, and, and, they're easy because you're you're trying to understand these viewpoints. You're trying to sauce them out together. And there are others where you're just going back and forth at a very peripheral level. So absolutely, this is this is something that applies to every single conversation we have. Why don't you think more people take time to be in the pocket with people? Is it because they're just not comfortable in the silence and there's like, oh, I got, I got to do something. I got to prove. I got to defend. Or, or is it something different? I suspect there are a lot of reasons. So, so most people are not comfortable with silence. Uh, and so if you have a conversation with somebody who's close to you, uh, whether it's a, a family member, you know, spouse, a, a child, a good friend, uh, you could sit there for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes in silence and nobody bats an eye. It's perfectly fine because both of you need time to reflect. Uh, but we find that really uncomfortable in most situations because generally silence, we treat silence as a little weird. If we saw an anchor on television, for example, reporting the news, be silent for two seconds, we think something wrong happened. 
we lost the audio or they forgot what they were going to say or they lost their teleprompter. So, so part of it is learning how to be a little bit more patient, a little bit more respectful that people need time to process. Part of it is, is that, you know, there's this mix of introverts and extroverts in the world and they relate to people very differently. And some introverts are perfectly fine in, in moments. So I'm an introvert. I'm perfectly fine talking with large groups of people. It's just that it zaps my energy. So I need to find ways to recharge afterwards. And of course, extroverts love that and, and, and have a tough time being alone and, and staying in silence. And neither one is right or wrong. It's just different, different mechanisms. But, but at the end of the day, you have a mix of different people that relate differently to each other. And so they may bring different skills into the conversation. And oftentimes those skills may not match perfectly well, which is why most people are really listening to respond, not to understand. Do you think it would benefit business owners and leaders and just humanity at large if they cultivated the skill set of being comfortable in nothingness? I think so. I mean, I, I think sometimes you need to you need to disconnect with you and your teams. I'll, I'll tell you something that we do once a week. Um, we do it once a month, but we've started doing it during the pandemic a little bit more often for parts of it. We, we have one team meeting. Uh, it, it's just about 45 minutes long once a week to talk about our product roadmap with our entire team. Otherwise, most of our conversations are asynchronous. And that meeting is about the product roadmap. But one thing we started doing years ago is we replace one of these weekly meetings with something called Anything Goes. Talk about anything except work. And so the idea was we wanted to connect as, as humans more so than as teammates. And we wanted to let the conversation flow about lots of topics that we would never be able to randomly talk about. And we started doing a little bit uh, weekly now, so 10, 15 minutes of every week, we we start talking about random things. We've had conversations for 45 minutes on time travel, on on um, about wars, about uh, climate change, about great books, movies, sports. And so part of that is an effort to connect with people in a way that you rarely connect at work and, and to give people the autonomy and flexibility to do that. And I think it's incredibly important. We've been a remote team for for 12 years a distributed team. And so we've learned the importance of that a long time ago. And I think the companies that are currently shifting and have shifted to remote and are trying to decide what do we do longer term uh, need to learn those lessons too. So with that being said, do you think culture can be built? Uh, I mean, you guys sounds like you're doing it. So the answer is going to be yes, but I would love to hear your perspective. Can culture be built with a digital team, one that's not coming into the office? The reason I'm asking that is there's companies who were had a corporate office and now with COVID, they don't have a corporate office. And now they're coming back uh, this year where they're like, uh, maybe we get people back in the office. Maybe we don't. And I've always just thought like, why can't they just create culture um, virtually if when they saw for the past nine months or 10 months, however long it's been, that they were able, everybody was able to get their job done um, from home? Like, can culture be built digitally? I believe so. Uh, we've done it. There are other companies that have successfully uh, been able to do so after decades in business, fully remote. You know, the thing about culture that, that I think a lot of people don't really talk about much is that you can't legislate culture. You can't just say, this is our culture. And, and, and a lot of entrepreneurs make this mistake. That they, they think that if they can create a mission statement and a set of values, that is their culture. It could be their culture if ultimately they put in place everything that supports all of those values. Uh, so if, if, if CEOs, for example, say part of our culture is making sure that customers are number one, but if the policies are actually not consistent with that. If the team doesn't see that as part of the culture, then it's not part of your culture. And so, so leaders, the best they can do is, is to aspire to create a culture, uh, to put in place and support the kinds of things that would create that kind of culture, to actively do and not just say, because actions are far more important than words, and, and hire people that respect those kinds of values that'll promote that culture. Um, what we find instead is, is they'll create a set of values and say, this is our culture. So when you looked at Uber before they rebranded and, and, and some of the problems they ran into with their culture years ago, they had values that seemed pretty good, but, but nobody aspired to those values. What they actually did was entirely different. A culture cannot be fiated. A culture exists. And if you take, as a leader, if you take no action, if you do nothing, you're still going to have a culture, just not one that you like.
Yeah, it reminds me of that old adage is like contracts are only as good as the people assigned them. It's almost like values are only as good as the people who are within the company, right? <laughs> yeah, and, th and this, is, this is one of my pet peeves too. There's, there's a little bit of a, I think a misnomer. When you think about companies hiring, you, you, you always have this culture interview and, and this notion of, you know, let's, let's test this person for culture. Are they a good culture fit? And the thing that I think people commonly misunderstand is, is every person that you add to a conversation or to a team changes the culture by definition. You can't add a person. So if you have a conversation with two people and a third comes in, even if you're all perfectly fine and have great conversations individually, a conversation between three people is going to be different. And the same way for a team, you add a person, they're not gonna just get absorbed into your culture and become nothing because at the end of the day, that's not how companies grow and that's not how companies are built. So, so culture fit is often a misnomer. You're not looking for somebody that will be identical to your culture. You're looking for somebody that will improve your culture, that will extend it forward and, and aspirationally make it even better than where you started. So good. It reminds me of like family. So my daughter's a little over two. She turned two in November. So she's like two and two months or whatever it is now. And so it's like before her, my wife and I had a culture. We had a set of values that we follow and embody. And then so part of being a parent then is like getting clear on those values, at least for us, and then instilling those values into my child. However, she's a certain individual soul with different values that she came to experience on this planet. And so now there's three of us. And so while we're instilling and leading her in those values, she's also bringing her own value hierarchy into the mix that we get to ebb and flow. And it's changed the dynamic of the family. Good. But if we're like, no, these are the values. This is what it must be. Well, there'd be a little bit more chaos than us trying to like co-create, still hold boundaries, giving her boundaries, don't get me wrong, but we're still open to like what's going to nourish her as well. Does that make sense? It's almost like culture and bringing people on the team is, is similar, right? Yeah. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, I, I, I fully agree with, with the way you approach your daughter. I have three kids. Um, they're a little older, so, so 22, 19, and, and 15. But, but we took a very similar approach. We, we recognize as parents we have this limited time frame to, to help our kids, to watch our kids, to educate our kids, to teach them some of the things we know. But we know that we didn't learn everything possible from our parents. We know that we learned some things, values, morals, the, the, that code came from our parents, our friends and, and, and people around us. And so we took the same approach with our kids, which is to try to teach them um, that it's important to have a good moral compass, that it's important to have a set of values that you believe in and that you don't have to have in advance have decided every single thing you're ever gonna to have to decide, but you should have a good moral compass. When you're faced with a decision that you've never faced before, as long as you have a good moral compass, you will decide the right way 99% of the time. And so we recognize we couldn't teach our kids everything as parents. And so we tried to teach them and, and also we're open to their own ideas uh, so that when they're older, and they're making decisions without us, which inevitably happens, uh, <laughs> they could make decisions that are good. And yes, they'll make mistakes, just like every one of us has made mistakes throughout our lives. But hopefully those mistakes are minimal and then recognize them and, and fix them. Mm. What's been one of your biggest like lessons that you've learned in this game of business? Well, there have been many. I mean, we've been in business for, for 12 years. So, so one of the important ones, so when, I, when I was looking to start my own business, um, I was coming out uh, of a career as a lawyer and I was very successful as a lawyer. I worked hard, uh, 13 years uh, as a lawyer, 12 of those years, I was the highest biller in my firm by far. The one year I wasn't the person who beat me and this wasn't a competition, it just he happened to, to have outbuilt me that year, um, was in the hospital for three years because of a detached rat, retina from reading so much material. So I worked hard as a lawyer. I was perfectly okay with that. Um, I thought becoming a business owner would be equivalent or maybe a little bit more of a lifestyle uh, business in that sense. Uh, and I was wrong about that. I mean, ultimately being a business owner is, is taxing in lots of different ways. You, you don't ever stop thinking about your business. There's just no way to turn the brain off. At least there's not for me. Uh, maybe some people could successfully do that. Um, and it, it's, it's like a roller coaster. There are, there are highs, there are lows. But, but one of the significant things, I mean, you have, you have a young, uh, young daughter, but one of the significant things was when I was ready to start, I talked to a few friends who had run businesses before, and I said, what, what's the biggest 
gotcha. What's the biggest thing I need to be thinking about? And, you know, most of them said kids, family, how to find a balance, that it's not easy to find a balance and that it's really, really um, important to do that at the earliest time possible. And at the time I started CrowdSpring, I had a, um, a five-year-old uh, and um, uh, a seven-year-old and a one-year-old. So I had, I had three little kids. Um, and I and I listened to that advice, and I, I don't think I immediately appreciated it. But but I remember in the first um, in the first few weeks leading up to launch of the business, so we had been working on it for about eight or nine months. Uh, my my daughter, my my seven year old, emailed me and said, "Hey, uh, are you um, are you coming home from Europe?" Uh, and I thought, "Well, I'm not in Europe. I'm sitting in my office, you know, 20 miles away from our home." But I hadn't been home in maybe two to three days, and and to her felt like I was away for a long time and I immediately packed up and went home. And that's when I realized I really need to invest much more time in, in you know, I had to work as hard on my family life and, and my, my emotional and physical well-being as I did on my business. Because at the end of the day, as we all know, when you're physically hurt and you can't do the kinds of things you wanted to do, it's painful, it's limiting. Um, it, it's both physically and emotionally taxing. And it's the same way when you're emotionally hurt. And so I wanted to make sure that as I work to build a successful business, I work to create a balance with my family and I work to make sure that emotionally and physically, I was ready to tackle that. So good. I find a lot of peep times for entrepreneurs, if they don't prioritize their family, it ends up sabotaging their business. Like it's, it's almost like in this game of life, it's almost like there's a, this thing that we call the success engine that's almost has like five cylinders of a, of a motor. You can call it faith, like your connection to source, God, universe, whatever it is, different things for different people, their confidence and certainty in themselves. And then there's like family and fitness and finance and fun. And if any one of those cylinders are blown or it's leaking a little bit of oil, so to speak, like we're hemorrhaging a little bit of our personal power and it actually impacts the entire performance of the entire overall engine. And I think a lot of times leaders think, well, when I make X amount of money or when my business gets to an X amount of point, then I can. But what happens is they have this motor with the blown cylinder and the motor, if you've ever driven a motor or a car with the blown cylinder, it'll go. It just requires a lot more fuel, <laughs> a lot more effort. And it eventually breaks down and burns out over time. And that tends to be see what I see happen with entrepreneurs and leaders who aren't really holistically looking at every aspect of their life and asking the question, how do I move this whole thing forward? Not rather like balance, like, okay, hour here, hour here, hour here, hour here, but more of like just maintaining the structure and balance of the overall engine, the whole health of the engine. So everything's propelling forward. And if they do that, then there are massive amounts of power that then translates into a lot of big momentum in the game of business, in the game of them being connected to their family. Have you found that philosophy to be true for yourself? I have. I, I think that's a, it's a great philosophy. I think one of the, one of the challenges, uh, and I just had a long conversation with my daughter about this, is, is people uh, never really think on what success is. I think, I think most people, particularly entrepreneurs, uh, most people assume that success is uh, monolithically having as much money as possible. And whether we actually think about it or not, when you ask most entrepreneurs, what they're looking to do is grow a huge business so they can buy big houses and buy airplanes and buy boats and travel and do all of those kinds of things that, that successful people appear to do. And, and so one of the challenges, I think, generally is that is that success, and there have been a lot of studies that, that have shown this, success doesn't necessarily create more happiness, not for everybody. Um, and after a certain level, after a certain level of financial comfort, and it's not that high. I mean, ultimately for, for a typical person, it's $75,000 a year. Um, if you're earning $75,000 a year or more, your level of happiness in incremental increases, even big increases doesn't change. And anecdotally, you hear lots of people saying, I've got friends who are millionaires who, are, who have hundreds of millions, and they're just not happy. Um, and, and a person that doesn't have millions or hundreds of millions says, well, how's that possible? You know, if you have that much money and you can do everything you want, uh, how can you not be happy? And at the end of the day, it's because it is true that what success means universally may be defined by financial success, but what it means to us individually isn't necessarily the same thing. So I didn't start CrowdSpring because I was looking to make billions of dollars. 
Uh, the day I started the company, the day I quit my law job and went full-time at CrowdSpring, I took a 97% pay cut. So uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't the key driver for me, but there were so many other things that, that, that drove that decision. And I think it's really important for people to, to take a step back and say, what does success mean to me? It's perfectly fine to say success means financial independence. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with that, but, but each person at the earliest possible time that they can do it should really ask themselves that question because once you can answer that question, you can really then hone in and, and find a way to balance all the other things. Because if, if money isn't the pure definition of success, is, is if more time with your family is, then it's far better to push yourself to balance business and family when you recognize that's so important to you. What was your driver for starting CrowdSpring? Like what was, like, what was just not, not mission statement or anything like that. What was just your genuine desire? So I, I love learning. Uh, you know, I, I don't think education ever stops. As an attorney, I learned every day. So I had cases which required to be, become an expert on uh, nuclear physics and mechanics on electrical engineering and on computer science. Uh, and this was amazing. It was, it was, you know, somebody was paying me to learn these complex fields. And I had to do that because I had to uh, cross-examine. I had to put on the stand some of the world's renowned experts in these areas. And the only way I can do that effectively was to, to really learn the material. And so, but the problem is that those opportunities were somewhat limited. I didn't get to do that necessarily every day. There was a lot of baggage associated with the practice of law, um, hearings and, and a lot of, a lot of busy work. And, and so I loved the days in court. I loved talking with experts. I didn't love some of the other stuff. I realized that being an entrepreneur, starting my own business, gave me the opportunity to do the same thing, but every day. And so, so I didn't know a lot about running a business, starting a business, and I had to learn all of that. I had to learn about substantive, you know, graphic design and naming businesses, and then about writing business plans and, and starting businesses and registrations and marketing and nurture campaigns and everything associated with creating a successful business. And so for me, that was just amazing because it was unlimited. Um, and, and today, if I want to do something new, um, it, it's, it's like a, you know, a, a, a smorgasbord of food almost, uh -huh. uh, I get to learn it. And so, so that was one of the key drivers is I really wanted the opportunity to learn. I also thought that um, at the end of the day, I wanted the flexibility to be able to control my destiny rather than work for somebody else. I, I wasn't so much focused on, can I make significantly more money or not? Because lawyers are well compensated. I was very happy. Uh, and and my family wasn't, wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't in need. I, I was paid very well, but but I, I also didn't control my own destiny entirely. I had to work for clients. I had I was a partner in a firm, but but ultimately working with 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 other partners. Um, and I thought this would give me a chance to to make my own decisions, to find a better balance that I have more control over than working as an employee for somebody else. So was it as a growth? Like you just wanted to experience more growth on a day to day basis. Yeah, I mean, that was a big part of it. Intellectually, I wanted to grow. Right. Uh, individually, I wanted to grow. Um, I wanted to to have just a bit more control over what day-to-day -day was like. And, and over the long term, it, it was interesting. I remember there's this this uh, this story, this parable that I'd read many, many, many years ago. This is right around the time I wanted to become an attorney. Um, and I'll probably get it wrong, but it's a, it's a fisherman in, in South America somewhere where you know, he's got, got a boat and, and goes to, so, so wakes up early, goes to fish, comes back to eat breakfast with his family. And, uh, and then in the afternoon goes out for a few more hours and is very happy. And then a management consulting firm comes in and says, you're doing it all wrong. Uh, what you need to do is you need to buy 20 boats. You need to spend the next 20 years working as hard as you possibly can, uh, build a huge business so that you can retire and have breakfast with your family and spend time with them. And, you know, in the afternoon, go out for a couple of days of fishing and, to which his answer is, but I'm already doing that. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, and so that's the thing. I, I, I looked at inwardly at the kinds of things that would make me happy and, and, and the balance that I think would make my family happy. And, and I made a choice that, that, that has worked fine for us. So good, man. I, I see this coaching a lot of people that they're addicted to this thing called the success equation, which is I'll be worthy or I'll be accepted or I'll be safe, whatever their equation is, when I have X, Y, or Z, or when I become A, B, or C. 
and then they get the X, Y, or Z, or they become the A, B, and C. And since they're still not enough or safe or worthy or whatever the thing, the feeling, the experience that they're trying to create, they just kick that X, Y, and Z or A, B, C down the road. And this is never ending journey. And it's something that we've been conditioned to believe uh, by our educational system and just a, a lot of our upbringing, um, mine included. And it's almost like when we can get to the, to the place where like you're successful just because you're successful in this moment or you're worthy or you're accepted or you're safe or you're secure. And then you go on the journey to go create your desires for you. It was like, I want to nurture growth every day. Then the money that we have seems to be just a, a byproduct, like a way of keeping score of, am I winning the game that I'm out to play or not? But our identity isn't attached to the money or the cars or the houses or anything of that nature. Have you found that to be true for you as well? I think so. I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, it's not that money is unimportant. Of course, money is important, but but I don't measure success uh, strictly in terms of money. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I, mean, I right. think there are lots of different perspectives and, and they're not incompatible. They can coexist in a world where, where different people are motivated by different things. Um, you know, success for me has been about helping business owners in 100 countries reduce the amount of money they pay for design. Success for me has been about having 220,000 freelancers around the world who are making millions of dollars on CrowdSpring, uh, working in a field that may be their primary field of knowledge. It may be they're a taxi driver and Moonlight is a designer. The beauty in our model is it doesn't matter whether they went to school in design, whether they uh, worked in a professional design agency, because you're not hiring them based on a whim. They're sharing their actual designs with you. And so when you pick your favorite design, you're picking what you already see. Mm -hmm. and, and so helping you know, people in, in, in the US, in Canada, in Europe, in Africa, in Malaysia, in, in the Far East, uh, apply their trade, make money, support their families is a huge motivator. And, and we hear from these people all the time uh, uh, how much we've been able to, to help them and, and, and push them forward. So, so you, you start out with a thought, you know, there are certain things that'll make me happy. And then you realize there are other things that make you happy too. I mean, one thing, one thing I've learned along the way is I've spent a lot of time and as a team, we spent a lot of time um, giving back to, to the community. So we, we, do a lot of writing. We, we share a lot of content, you know, things like how to write a business plan, how to start a business across lots of different industries, how to build a strong brand identity. And these are, you know, 3,000 to 20,000 word pieces that we write. We, we give away for free. And part of the reason we do it is we want to help people. But what I've learned is I actually learn better when I share because mm. it exposes me to public critique, it exposes me to public opinion, and it exposes, it forces me to articulate what I know in written form. And if I'm having a tough time articulating something, it means I don't know it as well as I should know it. And so, so I go good. back and relearn it. So good. What's been your biggest personal breakthrough on in your life so far? So I, I think ultimately I would measure it as, as having found a pretty good balance that makes me happy, uh, having found a pretty good balance in, in physical health. So, you know, I, I ignored it for the first two to three years of being an entrepreneur, probably a little bit more, probably the first five years of being an entrepreneur. I, like, like most entrepreneurs, I said, I just don't have time for this. And so, you know, family, business, something's got to give. So it was physical health. And, and then I saw uh, friends around me, other entrepreneurs who were, who were, getting into trouble because their bodies were, were falling apart and they were becoming sick. And, and I said, you know, there's gotta be a better way to, to create balance. And so I committed to, and as I said earlier, I committed to really focusing as hard, if not harder on all of the other pieces, not just the business. Um, so, so, you know, that's the year I, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to start riding a bike. And, and so today I ride between 150 and 200 miles a week. Awesome. Um, and, and that was, you know, big breakthrough um, balance. We talked about earlier, and I didn't appreciate in the very beginning that, that I couldn't just do what I used to do. Um, I had to work really hard to look for that balance, to find it, to make sure that I listen carefully to my kids, my wife, and, and create a situation that, 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 
didn't allow them to suffer simply because I was trying to build a business. And I think fundamentally women do this much better than men. Um, and, and so, so it, it was really hard for me, but, but I found that. And then ultimately finding success in my business, you know, the, the one thing that, that we do poorly as humans uh, generally is we have a really tough time, tough time uh, measuring and celebrating incremental success, so small successes. Uh, we tend to celebrate big things, birthdays, New Year's Eve, um, you know, 10 year anniversaries, uh, a huge sale. We don't celebrate little things. And, and one thing that for me was really instrumental was giving myself the ability to celebrate small successes because mm -hmm. there are far more of them. You can have small successes every day to celebrate them with your team, to celebrate with your family. And that creates an emotional reaction daily that you don't get unless you recognize small successes are important. Yeah, you're, you get to train your brain uh, and your reticular activating system to look for the wins. It's like every entrepreneur is running up a mountain of their chosen top of success, whatever it is, different things for different people. And very often they're comparing where they're at to the top of the mountain, which ultimately just amplifies the inner critic rather than taking the advice of what you're saying here, which is stopping and pausing and looking back at the parking lot and which from where they came, whether it's two days ago, a week ago, years ago, to start training their brain to look, to, to be like, yeah, man, we, we've come a long way and we still have a little bit more ways to go and we'll get there. Right. That's yeah. I mean, it was our joy. You know, it's interesting. A couple of uh, a week ago, I was I was in a sitting in our in our family room, dark room, no television, no phone, no books. And just in a dark room, my wife came in and said, "What's wrong?" I said, "I'm just at peace." I said, "I'm just thinking about stuff, and and I don't need distractions. I just, you know, this is the first time in maybe months I sat down like that without looking at a phone, without reading a book, without having the TV on, without listening to music." without any visual distractions. I think we need to do more of that. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to just just contemplate and think and, and reflect. I mean, we do that subconsciously when we sleep, we sure. occasionally do that, uh, but, but really we need to consciously do more of that because I it really helps us process what's going on in our lives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing. If you had, if you could give yourself some younger wisdom, like if your younger self could meet who you are now and you could give that younger self some wisdom, like what would you tell them that would help them collapse time and get results faster? So um, first of all, measure what success is at the earliest possible age that you can, because um, for me, it became a lot easier to understand what made me happy when I understood what success meant. Uh, when I, for myself, was able to say success isn't about making millions of dollars a year. Perfectly fine if that happens, but, but that's not how I'm gonna measure my own success. Number two, uh, to recognize as early as you can, and I, and I really talk to my kids about this all the time, that whatever you do, you know, the physical and emotional aspects of who you are have to be in sync too. So, so you can't run your life simply on fumes and not take care of your body because, you know, our bodies are not infallible. They're going to break down. You're going to get sick. You're going to hurt a limb. Um, and so it's important to invest as much time as, as, as you do in the other things in, in, in your body. And then ultimately, um, the other thing I've always been, a um, a big reader. I've always read a lot of books. When I was younger, um, I used to read mostly science fiction and you know, classics and science fiction. And, and then when I got into law school, I started reading more broadly. And that really helped me understand the world a lot better. So I wish when I was younger, I had started doing that uh, a lot more so. And it's one change I actually made with my kids. Uh, so my kids are bilingual. I've never spoken English to them. So my, my native language is Russian. I immigrated from Ukraine when I was nine. Uh, and so I've always spoken Russian to them. So from a very young age, they, they've, they've spoken, they've written, they've, they've read in, in Russian and in English. Uh, and my daughter is fluent natively in Spanish as well. But, but one thing I did with them, because I didn't want them tied to a particular genre of books, I think reading is important, is, is we did these challenges over the summers when they started going to school and started reading, which is, you know, Pick 10 biographies or autobiographies. Uh, and, I, and I gave them some parameters. I didn't just let them pick 10 random ones. I said, pick two people in sports, pick two people in politics, pick two entrepreneurs, 
pick two civil rights leaders. And so we had these categories, but they can go out and find whoever they wanted. Because I wanted them to read the things that I would have wanted to read when I, when I was younger, uh, to understand people better, to understand that, you know, that there are lots of different kinds of people, that, that there were athletes that, who are amazing human beings, uh, that there were politicians who really sought, sought hard to, to improve society, uh, that there were civil rights leaders who, who, you know, you knew about them at the periphery, but, but who were fundamentally instrumental at changing the, the, the course of history. Um, I wish I did that when I was younger. So I started doing that when I was in law school, but I wish I, I broadened my reach. And uh, if you look on my personal blog, uh, you'll see, I just recently started recording the books I've been reading, but I mean, I'm reading books on a lot of different topics uh, for that reason, because it, it's, it's amazing learning. Awesome. Well, dude, Ross, thank you so much for being here. If people want to learn more about like designs or working with you or your team, they just go to, to crowdspring.com or is there some other place you want to point them to? Crowdspring.com, C-R-O-W-D-S-P-R-I-N-G.com. Uh, we have a great blog at crowdspring.com slash blog where we get into uh, design, marketing, leadership, a lot, lot of good topics. Uh, and um, um, they're happy to, to find us on Twitter at Ross Kimborowski and at Crowdspring. Uh, we're, we're available there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, buddy, for being here. Appreciate you. Anthony, enjoyed the conversation. Well, there you have it, my friend, Ross Kimbarovsky. What a great conversation, right? I mean, we covered a lot of ground around design and I really love that we're able to dive into some of just his wisdom, like his wisdom around building and leading a team, some of his wisdom around personal breakthroughs, trials and tribulations that he's experienced um, in the game of business as well, which is really cool to hear. And I truly believe that inner game transformations, they always, always, always directly correlate to lasting external life and business transformations. And I'm so happy that Ross was willing to open up and share some of his journey and the lessons learned um, along the way, which is just like really, really cool. And my hope is that you're gonna be able to glean some of the wisdom that he shared to help you collapse some time and create the life and business that you feel called to faster. So my friend, that's all I have for this episode of the Anthony Chimix podcast. If you know someone who needs to hear this episode, send it over to them in their DM, screenshot it and share it on social media, send it to them in an email, text message, whatever you have to do to get this episode into their ear holes. And also keep those five-star reviews coming over on iTunes because that is what helps get this show found by more people. That way they too can break through to a whole new level of freedom, purpose, and success. Thank you so much for being here. Until next time, my friend, I'm out. Peace. Well, that's all I've got for this episode of the Anthony John Amix podcast, but we have plenty more to help you become unstoppable in life and business. So head on over to ajamix.com for exclusive resources, information, and tools to help you break through to a new level of freedom, purpose, and success. I look forward to having you back for the next episode. Bye for now.